Good afternoon. I'm very excited to welcome you to this health policy lecture, the Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture. I'm Claire Brindis. I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. We're very grateful to Steve Schroeder, who originated the concept of having a Chancellor's Lecture in this area. We know that health policy impacts all of our work, impacts health, health care. And to do the honors of introducing you to our wonderful speaker today, I'd like to welcome our wonderful Chancellor and um, give you an opportunity to give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, very much. And welcome, everyone. Uh, specifically, welcome to this ninth Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture. Uh, I love this series, so I'm really glad to see a great turnout for our speaker. Um, this series has brought outstanding health policy leaders to UCSF to provide for us different perspectives on current health policy issues and to highlight the important role that health policy plays in the lives of our faculty, fellows, residents, and students. Last May, Mark McClellan, director of the Brookings Institution's Engelberg Center for Healthcare Reform, discussed the impact and implementation of the Affordable Care Act that was signed into law March 2010. Our speaker today knows a great deal about healthcare reform. Judy Ann Bigby serves as Secretary of Health and Human Services for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and is leading the implementation of Massachusetts' pioneering health insurance reform legislation. Dr. Bigby has had an impressive professional journey. A native New Yorker, she and her siblings were the first in their family to attend college. After graduating from Wellesley College, she went on to attend Harvard Medical School to complete training as an internist and to begin a career in academic medicine. Dr. Bigby has a broad range of experience as a primary care physician, professor, researcher, health policy expert, and champion of change. All of these roles prepared her well for her current position. We're all wondering what you're gonna do next. Dr. Bigby's career has been devoted to addressing disparities in health care, and her list of accomplishments is long, so I'll only say a few to give her time to talk. As Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Bigby served as Medical Director of Community Health Programs at Brigham and Women's Hospital. She has contributed to many boards and expert panels, including the Boston Public Health Commission, the Institute of Medicine's Committee on Assuring the Health of the Public in the 21st Century, and the Minority Women's Health Panel of Experts for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Additionally, from 2003 to 4, she served as president of the Society of General Internal Medicine. She is also well known to our leadership at the UCSF National Center of Excellence in Women's Health. In her prior role as the director of Harvard's National Center of Excellence in Women's Health, Dr. Bigby worked with Nancy Milliken and Dixie Horning in developing the Center of Excellence national model designed to advance the health and well being of women and girls across diverse communities. These colleagues tell me that Dr. Bigby is brilliant, strategic, courageous and unstoppable in her pursuit of improving health and health care for all. So I can't wait to hear your remarks. Dr. Bigby, Madam Secretary, as California and the rest of the nation are working to implement health care reform, we look forward to hearing about your bold experiment and significant experience in Massachusetts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bigby. Well, thank you so much, Chancellor. I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm very happy to see so many uh, friends uh, from my former life uh, to hear what Nancy Milliken and Dixie uh, think about me. Uh, Nancy once asked me what I wanted to do after uh, leaving Harvard. I said I wanted to be the mayor of Boston. I no longer want to be mayor, let me tell you that. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank Claire uh, Brindis for um, pursuing me and for allowing me to do a do-over, if you will, since I couldn't be here last December when this uh, was originally scheduled. Um, Massachusetts, um, as you all know, is in 
the public eye almost all the time. I get lots of emails from people around the country saying, look at what they're saying about Massachusetts health care reform now. So I hope that I can give you a flavor for uh, what we did in Massachusetts, the challenges that we faced um, and will face going forward as we try to reconcile uh, what we did in Massachusetts with the Affordable Care Act, um, but also talk a little bit about the challenge um, that we're uh, focused on right now, um, now that we have near universal coverage. Um, and that task is a much more complicated um, and challenging uh, task. So I will review the Massachusetts law. I'll give you some sense of what we've been looking at in terms of trying to uh, assess the impact of the law, and I'll do a little bit about our approach to cost containment. I want to say a word about some of the data that I'll be showing. We um, do uh, surveys on an annual basis to really measure the impact of the reform on coverage. You'll see that um, when I report on our uninsurance rate that it's slightly lower than what the US Census says, and there's a methodologic difference there that accounts for that. But if you want information about the actual survey we use and the methodology, um, you can um, access it on this website that I have up there. The other um, area where we do surveys to try to assess our um, results is uh, an annual Massachusetts employer survey, which uh, there's a little bit of an overview of that here. But again, this is available on our uh, mass.gov. Uh, slash DHCFP, which is the Div Division of Healthcare Finance and Policy, if you just want to Google it, um, to look at the methodologies. Um, Massachusetts had a very strong foundation for reform, and I think that this is um, part of what may be challenging for other states. Number one, we had a relatively low rate of uninsurance to begin with. It was less than 10%. We also had very high rates of employer offer. Um, there was also a 20-year history of incremental health coverage expansion. So, for example, under Governor Dukakis, uh, the state implemented, in collaboration uh, with the federal government, expansion of disabled workers into our Medicaid program who were actually employed but who needed community support services in order to be able to get to work. And so um, there's a special program called Common Health um, that uh, covered those workers. Um, Massachusetts also had a very uh, liberal Medicaid eligibility and um, did a good job of trying to find those people. Um, so there was deep penetration among the eligible individuals. We had uh, what was then called an uncompensated care pool, which paid for the care for uninsured individuals if they went to acute hospitals or community health centers. This fund um, comes from an assessment on hospitals, insurers, some employers, and the state contributed to that pool as well. And many of the private insurance protections that uh, were celebrated last September in ACA um, were already uh, implemented in Massachusetts. So pre-existing condition, uh, caps on insurance, those were things that consumers in Massachusetts um, did not experience. So these are um, the elements of Massachusetts reform. The first is the individual responsibility, which is um, probably the most controversial, um, both in Massachusetts and of the federal reform. It applies to all adults 18 and older um, if they have access to affordable insurance. In order to protect people since they're required to have insurance, uh, their coverage must meet minimal credible coverage, and there was a independent board created to define what that is. Um, penalties uh, for those who do not comply with this cannot exceed 
half of the least expensive premium available through our insurance exchange. Um, but people um, who have an income less than 150% of federal poverty level and certain religious factors are, are exempted. Um, 97% of the tax filers in Massachusetts report on uh, their health insurance. 95% of them um, comply with the mandate by having annual health insurance. We've assessed less than 1.2% of tax filers um, because they were not in compliance with the mandate. This is about 26,000 people um, total. One of the areas that we have to reconcile in Massachusetts with the Affordable Care Act is uh, the difference between um, uh, both the, the penalty for individual coverage um, and the definition of affordability. Um, and we're still waiting for um, what uh, basic health plan will be. Um, the employer's responsibility in Massachusetts um, consists of an assessment on employers with more than 11 full-time equivalents um, if they don't make a fair share contribution to health insurance. And the contribution is something like um, pay at least 50% of the premium, and at least 75% of your employees must take up insurance. Uh, that's a simplistic description of the regulation, which is a little more complex than that, but that's the gist of it. Employers also, with uh, more than 11 FTEs, must offer a Section 125 plan or pay a free rider surcharge if their employers use our safety net pool. What that does is require them to offer to their employees um, access to or uh, the ability to purchase health insurance with pre-tax dollars uh, if they're not going to offer insurance. We have had no one in Massachusetts assessed for this free rider surcharge um, because they're all in compliance uh, with this. We've had um, about a total of $20 million in uh, employer assessment fees due to employers who do not meet the fair share contribution um, since health reform was implemented. This is another area that we're going to have to reconcile with the federal law. Um, we are discussing whether Massachusetts will end up with two penalties, the state and federal penalty. There's also a difference between small employers definition in uh, state and federal law. And uh, the assessment is quite different in the federal law. It's $2,000 per employee. So these are things that we're looking at right now to determine um, what direction we'll go in Massachusetts. Um, the, fourth, the third element of reform in Massachusetts is government support for or subsidy for low-income residents. We expanded Medicaid eligibility to include some adults who previously either were not uh, eligible or there was a cap on the number of people that we would accept. We uh, raised that cap and have not reached it. We also expanded expand, uh, uh, eligibility for children up to 300% of federal poverty level. We did that through our our waiver. Um, and then the Commonwealth Care Program was created for adults up to 300% of federal poverty level, and those uh, that coverage is offered through our exchange. It turns out that about 60 to 70% of people who are eligible for Commonwealth Care in Massachusetts will be eligible for Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and what we now have to reconcile is in Affordable Care Act, uh, people are subsidized up to 400% of federal poverty level um, and uh, how we will implement that subsidy in Massachusetts. The last thing that I want to spend a little time on is expansion of the insurance options for uh, individuals. We merged our small group and individual market. Um, so premiums are based on the uh, combined pool. This decreased premiums for individuals by 30 to 40 percent. Small businesses saw an increase in their premiums of about 2 percent. There's also a standardization of direct 
uh, purchase products through the Commonwealth Choice Program. Um, and there are three standard benefit levels, and I'll show you a little bit of that a little bit later. Uh, we also created the Young Adult Plan with limited benefits at a very reasonable cost and allowed young adults to stay on their parents' insurance up to 20, age 26 um, under some circumstances. So you'll see that um, many of the features of uh, ACA um, actually do have a foundation in um, the Massachusetts law. So now I'm going to move on to just show you what has happened to coverage. Um, this shows you the number of individuals with health insurance between 2006 and 2010, and obviously the bill was signed in April, and the first implementation occurred in October of 2006. We're estimating that approximately 411,000 individuals are newly insured as of December 31st, 2010. This is a really hard number to a track, um, and it's um, been interesting doing it through the recession uh, as uh, the number of unemployed has um, increased in Massachusetts. If you look at um, where people are getting insurance, most of the insurance uh, as of June was through the public um, programs. Um, however, this was preceded by significant increases in employer-sponsored insurance, but as the unemployment rate in Massachusetts increased, the gains in ESI decreased. Um, the unemployment rate in Massachusetts has now decreased to 7.4%, but we know from previous recessions that there's a significant lag time uh, between when the economy starts to recover and the need for government programs um, declines. So we're waiting to see what happens. This shows you where people um, are covered. Uh, this light blue bar part of the bar represents employed sponsored insurance. The uh, dark part of the bar represents those with individual purchase. Uh, the gray part is our Medicaid program, which is called Mass Health. And then the very top sliver uh, is the Commonwealth Care program. And you can see that over time, the percentage who are in the uh, employed sponsored uh, coverage has decreased as a percent of the total. Many people say, well, in Massachusetts, employers simply would stop offering insurance and pay the penalty because that was going to be cheaper for them or that access to public programs would crowd out um, private insurance. But as you can see, um, the offer rate actually um, increased. Um, and in 2010, it was 77%, which compares to in US averages of about 60%. This shows you the percent of uh, take up of employed sponsored insurance, which remains quite high. And if you look at this according to the size of the employer, you see that uh, among small employers, 80% um, of their employees are taking up insurance, which is about the same in the large group. Uh, in the mid sized group, at least for these uh, two time points, there's a little bit of a decline. But this is a quite high um, take up. And this shows you uh, the U.S. and Massachusetts rate of uninsurance through um, 2010, and you can see that uh, there's a little bit of a difference between Massachusetts and the U.S. I will point out that the figures I'm using here for the U.S. are U.S. Census data, and this is our own survey. But if we were to look at Massachusetts through the U.S. Census, it would be about 3.5% in 2010, so still a huge difference. We estimate that there are about 150,000 um, individuals uh, uninsured in these three categories, children, um, non-elderly adults, and elderly adults. One of the things that we were finding with non-elderly adults is that they were jumping in and out of the individual purchase market. So they would purchase insurance when they needed health care, and then um, 
let it go afterwards. Um, when we initially passed reform, we uh, decided against having an open enrollment and closed period for the individual purchase just to make sure that people had access to insurance. When we started looking at data to suggest that people were jumping in and out, uh, last year we implemented an open enrollment period, so now people must enroll during a specific period uh, and can't leave. One of the things um, that we've found to be very helpful is to try to understand the impact of reform on various subpopulations. In this slide, you'll see that for 2008, 9, and 10, when we look at the percentage of in uninsured by race and ethnicity, the, um, the overall rate, again, is 1.9 in 2010. Um, and it was 1.7 among whites, 1.5% among um, those who are uh, a minority other than Hispanic, and 3.9% among Hispanics. And while this rate among um, Hispanics is much larger than among whites, for example, you can see the significant decline in the percentage who are unassured in this population, which is probably the hardest um, population um, to insure in the nation. If we look at uh, uninsurance rates by poverty level, we see that in spite of reform, it is still those who have incomes less than 150% of federal poverty level who are likely to be um, uninsured, but again, the rate has gone down significantly over time. So who are the uninsured in Massachusetts? They're more likely to be male, um, Hispanic, non-citizens, low income, uh, with less formal education and non-working or working only in part-time jobs. So as people think about who does the outreach need to go to, um, this is where our efforts are continuing um, in terms of our focus. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the work that we've done to try to understand whether this has made a difference in terms of access. Um, so one of the things you've heard about Massachusetts is that health care reform created uh, this terrible uh, primary care shortage and people can't get it care anyway, even though they have insurance. Well, um, this slide shows you the percentage of adults who report a usual source of care in the fall of 2006, just as we were implementing reform, and then um, la in 2009, the last year we have complete survey data. And you can see that for all adults, it went from 87 to 90 percent. But for people who um, have incomes less than 300 percent of poverty, um, there was a significant increase from 80 percent to 85 percent. And for minority adults also, um, the percent who said they now had a usual source of care increased from 84 to 91 percent. Um, we have seen individuals report that um, they still have difficulty accessing some physician services, especially specialists, and especially if they're uh, insured by our public programs. Um, one of the things that we've tracked, which has not changed um, since reform, is the use of the emergency department for non-emergency care. And we have not seen that decline um, as yet, and we need to do a better job of understanding why that is. This slide shows the um, importance of community health centers in Massachusetts um, to improve access to care for those who are now insured. Um, one of the things that we did in Massachusetts uh, with reform in 2007, we created a uh, loan repayment program. So for new providers who came in to work at community health centers, they could get loans repaid up to $75,000 um, over a three-year period if they agreed to work for at least three years in a community health center. Now, when we first started this program, I said, well, this is great, but there are no primary care docs out there who will take us up on that offer. But we have over 150 uh, new providers who came into Massachusetts for this. And you can see here um, the importance of community health centers um, and making sure that there is access. This study by the Kaiser Foundation shows 
shows that um, just uh, in the first year of reform, the number of uh, patients who went into community health centers increased by 50,000. Um, and this was mostly among uh, the public sus uh, subsidized um, population. And you can also see the percent of uninsured that the health centers were seeing um, decrease substantially. When we look at whether or not um, people are using care, what we found is that um, the uninsured also experienced um, an increase in access. So they also reported a somewhat uh, smaller increase um, in having a usual source of care, um, but also made uh, doctor visits and dental visits uh, and reported that they were like, less likely to have an unmet need for care um, after reform. This slide um, shows some uh, data on the impact of access among women, an issue that you've heard uh, is particularly of interest to me. And again, it um, shows the importance of looking at subpopulations um, through this initiative. As you can see, the percentage of women who are insured went from 91 to 97 percent. Um, for low-income women, it went from 85 to 94 percent. And for, 90, for minority women, from 80 to 95.5 percent. Um, but the percentage of women who have a usual source of care went up for minority women. Those who uh, avoided care because they didn't uh, um, have the money to pay for it, decreased among both low-income and minority women. Um, and uh, in other things that we've looked at in terms of look, uh, taking prescription drugs, um, there was some significant increase among minority women. If we look at the typical indicators um, for uh, women's health, we don't see a huge change between the, f uh, the year before reform and the year after reform was implemented, except um, in a couple of areas, um, the percentage of women who reported they didn't fill a prescription because of cost um, decreased from 11 to 5 percent. Um, Again, people who have personal providers increased, um, and those who did not um, get care due to cost decreased as well. Uh, and we saw that the number of people who had flu shots went up. But other typical indicators in terms of mammograms and pap smears, uh, use of birth control unfortunately did not change. One of the um, uh, hypotheses that I have about why this is so important for women is that we spent uh, a lot of effort crafting uh, access to insurance for women based on their reproductive status because we wanted them to have healthy babies and to be healthy as they're taking care of young children. Um, this actually obviously changed during reform. So one of the things that we've been looking at is what is the impact of reform on prenatal care. Um, this slide shows you that over time the percentage of women who are covered by uh, either public or publicly subsidized uh, insurance went uh, uh, increased over time. Um, and the percent who were privately insured um, decreased. And this year, for the first time, we've been able to see that perhaps um, having continuous coverage may make a difference in terms of women getting adequate prenatal care. So you can see that, for the most part, adequate prenatal care, in spite of millions of dollars, quite frankly, spent in programs trying to um, encourage women who are low income or minority to get prenatal care in Massachusetts, which has been going on for almost 20 years, didn't seem to have much of an impact. But for the first time, we've seen an increase among both privately insured and publicly insured women in terms of the adequacy of prenatal care. Um, our hypothesis is that if women are already covered, they'll get into care sooner. We will continue to look at this um, to see whether this is true. And now I want to turn to cost and affordability, as you all um, 
are aware, one of the things that we've been criticized for um, is the statement that health care reform has busted the Massachusetts budget. Um, so I want to present some information about that. Um, this is a table that comes out of a paper that Joel Weissman and I published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So you may not be able to read everything on here, uh, but I just want to walk you through um, what is on this table. If you look at this first column, this is the financing that the Commonwealth had for um, coverage of different populations uh, before reform, and it includes this funding um, that Massachusetts had really as a down payment on reform um, prior to its implementation. So 1.4 billion, I'm sorry, yeah, billion dollars. Um, this money comes from coverage uh, related to supplemental payments to certain providers um, to care for uninsured populations. It also is the money that was in the uncompensated care pool um, that I mentioned to you before. Um, this money, much of it, was converted to pay for the coverage in the Commonwealth Care Program. Um, and so you see that. Uh, through the slide across here. When we look at the total amount of new state spending at the end of fiscal year 2009, which uh, was the second year of implementation, um, total new state spending uh, was $172 million, which was less than 1% of the state budget. So the notion that health reform in and of itself um, bankrupted our budget um, is decidedly not true. The other thing um, that um, people have suggested is that it's all um, either employers or government who uh, supported this initiative. Overall spending on health care reform um, was uh, shared by all. In fact, there was a study done by Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation in May of 2009 that found that um, the incremental spending on health care reform um, was equally shared among individuals, government, and employers. I would say that I wish the economy hadn't tanked starting in 2008. It definitely made health reform challenging. Um, and what we found is that as people lost their jobs, this program actually works. Um, people who, who lost their jobs and became un, uh, long term unemployed became eligible for government programs. And the other thing that worked is the tradition the federal government has of enhancing uh, contributions to safety net programs, um, that is counter-cyclical funding. So as um, people become unemployed and the recession hit, uh, federal support to states increases. And uh, during the height of the recession, uh, Massachusetts actually spent less on uh, our Medicaid population than we did before because of enhanced FMAP and the ability of the federal government to support um, this enrollment. However, everything is not peachy in Massachusetts as it uh, uh, concerns the cost of care. Um, as you can see from this slide, the median cost of individual, uh, individual premiums has uh, continued to rise, but it was a path that we were already on way before reform. And as no surprise, as uh, premiums become more expensive, um, employers are actually contributing less, and the value of what they're purchasing is also less. This uh, slide demonstrates to you um, how the, the affordability standards that our um, connector board set relates to um, premiums in Massachusetts. So what this slide demonstrates to you is on the first column is the premium cost for an individual in the state employee system. So this is what our state pays for health care coverage. The green is what the employer contributes. The blue is what the individual con contributes. The second bar represents what the average employer premium is for an individual. 
and the green again is what the employer contributes, and the blue is what the individual contributes. The next bars represent the cost of care and our state subsidized programs, the Commonwealth Care Program. And this is what um, we're paying for individual premiums um, for people who are less than 150% of federal poverty, they pay no contribution. And then on a sliding scale, their contribution increases with their income up to 300%. This is what the young adult plan in Massachusetts cost without any drugs. And then this is the standard for the bronze, silver, and gold plans under Commonwealth Choice, which individuals can purchase through our insurance exchange. This line across here represents the affordability standard for somebody with an income of $39,000 a year. <coughs> for 44,000 or for 54,000. So this is the way we track whether or not um, health the purchase of insurance or the premiums um, are actually affordable to individuals. And this is the way we use our affordability standard. <coughs> Other things that we look at um, is really trying to um, understand whether or not people experience um, health care as being affordable. So on this slide, you see what adult out-of-pocket spending has been as a percent of income uh, in 2006 and 2009. And the percentage of people who had out-of-pocket expenses that was greater than 5% of their family income decreased from 22 to 15%. The percent who experienced more than 10% of family income decreased from 10 to 4 percent. This shows um, the percentage of adults who report that they have an unmet health care need due to cost. And you can see again that um, especially for low-income individuals, the percentage who said that they had an unmet need decreased from 26 to 15 percent. This slide um, shows the growth in health care spending that is expected in Massachusetts um, between now and 2020. Um, the red is per capita health care expenditures, and the other lines represent common economic indicators that we and the rest of the country use. Um, the, the kind of, uh, this line represents per capita GDP, um, this is wage and salary, and this is consumer price index. One of the things that we're struggling with in Massachusetts right now is to what do we want to anchor the growth in health care spending? What is a reasonable indicator to do that with? But you can see that no matter what indicator we use, health care uh, is projected to basically uh, consume much more of our dollar than anything else. Um, this shows uh, per capita spending um, projected out to 2020, uh, and it assumes that um, the cost will double from this amount back from here in 2010 at about 10,000 per capita to um, 2020, where it's projected to be 17,000 per capita. So we are focused a lot on what do we do to um, fix this trend. As we look at um, what we need to do to decrease costs, we have really looked at this from a much more systemic um, approach. I know that a lot of people talk about payment reform um, reports and legislation in Massachusetts, but we really are looking at this more systemically. This side of the slide represents what probably everyone will agree is wrong with the system that we have now. Too many people are uninsured. There are too many financial barriers. The costs are too high, volume-driven, fee-for-service. Uh, we aren't using health information technology in a, a useful way. Um, and more importantly, that um, we don't see the type of consistent quality outcomes, too many errors, too much misuse, overuse, duplication. We have huge disparities in care, poor coordination, not always evidence-based, and I'm sure it won't 
surprise you that I think the emphasis on specialty care is not good. This is where we want to get to. Um, and these are some of the interventions that Massachusetts is looking at in order to get from this side to this side of the slide. And I'll just talk about a few of those in the last few minutes here. Um, the Healthcare Quality and Cost Council, uh, which was created in Chapter 58 and which I chair, adopted an 11 point strategy for containing costs in Massachusetts, which you see is pretty comprehensive. You can read the full report um, on this website. But while payment reform is at the top of the list, there are other things that we see as just as important health information technology, health resource plan. Planning, um, encouraging healthy behaviors. Malpractice reform is a big issue. Every physician group I go to talk to in Massachusetts says, wait, don't talk to us about payment reform. We want to see malpractice reform first so that we can decrease the cost of defensive medicine. As we um, have uh, looked at what we can do as government to try to push the system from one side of the slide to the other. Uh, Governor Patrick filed a bill in February that really is about reforming the system through payment reform. A lot of the bill is focused on creating an infrastructure to support system reform incentives to motivate uh, providers to become more integrated by establishing standards for what integration means. The payment authority um, really is around deciding uh, what type of um, Alternative payments, uh, would we be implementing in Massachusetts? How do we define them? How do we measure them? Understanding the cost for providers to move from non-integrated to integrated systems. Making sure that providers don't take on financial risk without the backup to support those risks as often happened during uh, managed care capitation uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, making sure that we're implementing health information technology in a way that we get the outcomes that we want to achieve. Um, we're also looking at government as innovator. So part of the things that we're doing um, to promote this transformation is trying to use our purchasing power as state government to uh, promote change. So this is basically our Medicaid program, our state employee program, and the Commonwealth Care, or the subsidized program. And we've all aligned our policies related to things that we think we should not be purchasing, um, such as uh, hospital acquired infections, um, and more recently we implemented a policy related to not paying for preventable readmissions within 30 days. Um, we're also focused on um, developing integrated systems for specific populations, including um, in general primary care, and we have a multi-payer patient-centered medical home demonstration, which every payer in Massachusetts is participating in, um, and this is really moving from a fee-for-service payment for every 15 minutes appointments in primary care to um, paying providers to um, take care of people, to pay them for care coordination, for care management, and have them share in the savings that we see coming from decreased admissions or ED visits and better outcomes. Um, we also have initiatives uh, where we're asking providers to come together in a more integrated fashion to provide care to people um, in the primary care set setting with comorbid behavioral health problems. This population represents about 5% of our Medicaid um, members, but consumes 45 to 50% of cost. We also are looking at uh, working with CMS on developing an integrated uh, care management and payment system for dual eligibles and working with safety net providers to develop integrated care organizations through our 1115 waiver, uh, which I want to spend just a moment on. 
Um, we've had a lot of uh, history with safety net providers in Massachusetts. Um, Boston Medical Center is um, very famous. Um, uh, they went through a merger which transitioned them from a public hospital into a private not-for-profit hospital. Uh, Cambridge Hospital is now known as Cambridge Health Alliance, and it's really the only public hospital that we have left in Massachusetts. Uh, part of what um, Chapter 58, the health care reform bill in 2006 did, was to say to these institutions, um, we've been giving you a lot of supplemental payments. Those payments won't be necessary because now people will be covered and we'll be paying you for the care um, that these people receive. Well, um, I don't think uh, people spend a lot of time on the math there. But uh, it's been a hard transition. And what we are doing now is kind of stepping back and saying, what is the best way to support these safety net systems, um, but still hold them accountable for improving the experience of care, improving the health of populations, and also um, being efficient uh, and doing a better job at controlling cost. We um, also decided we needed to look at um, who is really providing most of the care to our uh, Medicaid members in Massachusetts. And so we have defined safety net in a slightly different way than traditionally has been. This slide shows you all 65 acute care hospitals in Massachusetts. Um, and what we did is we looked at those who had a payer mix that was one standard deviation above the average for Medicaid payments and one uh, standard deviation below the average for commercial payers. Um, and these blue circles represent the hospitals who fulfill that. So this is our new definition of safety net hospital. And we've been working with all of them um, on this uh, transformation uh, that we're uh, negotiating in conjunction with CMS. When we look at what these um, providers are, they're hospitals, maybe physician practices, a lot have a, uh, affiliated health centers, other types of providers such as behavioral health or family planning, um, two have health plans, many do projects or programs in conjunction with their local public health. We have all kinds of different ways we pay for these things. Um, and right now, um, we don't necessarily align them. What we're um, trying to do is um, create a system in where we ask the safety net hospitals to form these types of integrated care organizations. Um, that includes the hospital, physicians, health centers, other providers, um, maybe their public health authority, and maybe the health plan. Um, that we take all the payments that go to these providers um, and pool them into an integrated payment system, with one exception. Part of what we pay for um, with uh, public health dollars are medical care expenses that were necessary before we uh, created universal access because nobody paid for those types of things. What we're trying to identify are those public health dollars that are now going toward medical care um, pull them out of the system and um, use them to help support more public health program um, to be in collaboration with these integrated networks um, to promote the type of population health um, that we'd like to see. So that is um, an example of how we're taking what we learned from uh, where we are with coverage to redesign the system. And I must say, we've learned a lot from the California waiver. In fact, the hospitals come to me all the time and say, well, we want what California got. They got all that money uh, to uh, uh, link their payments to quality. Um, so we're looking very hard at the proposal that was approved by CMS in your uh, 1115 waiver.
So I'm going to um, end here with a summary. Um, clearly, um, we can cover people through the mechanism um, that we used in Massachusetts reform. Um, and we estimate that there are about 400,000 people who are covered who were not covered before. Um, offering expanded government-sponsored health insurance did not crowd out employer um, private insurance. Um, but actually offered an affordable coverage to low-income working individuals who would otherwise not be able to afford it. Government individuals and employers shared equally in the expenses of expanded coverage, at least prior to the recession. Um, but there was a commitment that this is a shared responsibility. And we've been able to see measurable impacts on access and affordability. Um, in our next uh, Health Reform 2.0, as we call it, controlling cost um, is not simply about controlling costs, but it's about improving care and lowering costs through that intervention. Um, it's going to take a lot more work than it took to get to near universal coverage. Um, and I'm very inspired by the people that I work with in Massachusetts to try to get us there. So that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very illuminating conversation with us. Uh, we may have time for one or two uh, brief questions as we end the session, but thank you so much. The question is, uh, what lessons have we learned from our Massachusetts Health Exchange, the connector, especially as it relates to what is the value of the exchange um, and what about the criticism from small business. So, um, you know, I think the vision for the exchange uh, in Massachusetts is somewhat different than what is envisioned in the federal uh, reform. And one of the questions that I think we're struggling with is when you have 98.1% of people with coverage, um, what is the role of the exchange and what function um, should it have in a, a system where all the other players who were there before reform are still there? And that's um, a question that I think we uh, need to ask. But um, from my point of view, there's lots of opportunity for the exchange to, in Massachusetts, perform several functions that um, we're not doing so well with right now. Number one, um, as we um, align our reform with the Affordable Care Act, there are people who will um, go in be back and forth between the Medicaid population and those who are eligible for federal subsidies. The exchange should make it so that when somebody's income changes, and their payment for their coverage moves away from straight Medicaid to federal subsidy, if they're in that margin, and the ACA allows us to do this up to about 200%, who's paying for their care should be invisible. And the exchange should be set up in such a way that an individual could go to that exchange, put in their information, be told, here are the options for you for health insurance. Let them pick something. And behind the scenes, administratively, we should manage what's happening to their eligibility for government or subsidized programs. So we could do that better. The other thing I think is um, the exchange could provide more transparency for consumers around what are you purchasing with your premium dollar and make it easier for them to understand that. In terms of the criticism of small business, um, small business would have liked to have seen the exchange make their premiums lower. That is not happening, but the exchange doesn't have the ability to do that. Um, people don't have to purchase their um, plan through the exchange, through small business. They're still using brokers. Um, it's a very um, mixed uh, message, I think, that we're trying to give to people. So that's something we're still working through. Thank you. Let's, let's one more question. Dr. Ma? 
Well, first, uh, so the question is um, whether or not the Affordable Care Act um, should have done more to contain cost at the time um, that the legislation was developed and passed. Um, so let me just go back to Massachusetts. Massachusetts clearly elected to tackle the issue of coverage before cost, and I think that's the right thing to do, given um, how the governor's bill has been kind of sitting there since February. Um, I don't know if we're going to get a cost con control bill in Massachusetts. It's simply a very uh, difficult thing to do. It's a lot more complicated than universal coverage and in spite of the fact that um, attitudes have evolved over a couple of years, uh, and I do believe that the people who see shared responsibility see that. Um, they have different opinions about how to do it. So I don't believe um, it's possible to take care of everything all at once. That said, there are important provisions in the Affordable Care Act, which I think will be very instrumental in helping to control cost. And we're working in partnership with CMS um, to take advantage of some of those provisions um, that exist in the Innovation Center at CMS. Um, uh, some of the initiatives that we want to build on, the dual eligible program, health homes, um, other things. I think that it's a lot harder to simply set out a plan to implement those provisions, and which is why maybe people think there are no cost containment provisions in the bill, but um, that's inaccurate. On that note, uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Bigby for her really wonderful talk. <laughs>